In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. So thanks for coming. So basically, uh, how many of us are new? Okay. So it's a, just a continuation of the class. You know, you can fit in whenever you come in. So basically, it's the study of the church, the mystery of the church. Because as we said in the very beginning of the, uh, of the class, that uh, if like you are, let's say, a baseball you know, player, and you don't understand the field and the rules, you can't do it. You have to know the rules of the game, the nature of the field, and so on and so forth. So as members of the church, we have to know the field. As Jesus himself called, calls it, the field where he plants the weed. The, the weed? No. The wheat. <laughs> the, <laughs> the wheat, okay? Where the devil wants to plant the weeds okay to confuse us okay so we are a field jesus uses different analogies but that of the field is you know very very important so we have to know the field we have to know basically who we are in order to respond well to the grace of salvation the master is offering to us so the mystery of the church is very important we are mystery we are mystical members of the mystery of the body of Jesus Christ. He has called us to that unity or union with him and to the Father in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So, um, just uh, we have these books, but I don't think many of us have them, so we'll print out some copies. Maybe we'll be ready by next class, but we'll get the books. But this is what we follow. So we are on page 113. Page 113. So that's where we are. So the, um, what we are discussing there is the principle of unity. Remember, like uh, the body, the body is a unit. It's like a unity, okay? one body. So the body is a unit, but it has many parts to it. And so what keeps the body integral, united, is what we call the human soul. Although some people may not believe it, but the human soul keeps the integrity of the human body. The body is integral. It is a unit because of the soul that keeps it united. So when the soul leaves the body, what do we call that? Yeah. Death. Death. And then what happens to the body? Decomposes. It decomposes. It corrupts because the principle that unites it has left and therefore it corrupts that's what we call death when the soul leaves the body so in the same way as the mystical body of jesus christ we have our principle of unity just as the soul keeps the body as one unit so the holy spirit keeps the entire body of jesus christ one so it doesn't mean that the body every part of the body is uniform no we have eyes, we have ears, we have legs, we have hands. But all those, although they perform different functions, but they are united. They are united by one principle, the soul. So all of us are different individuals, different members, but different members of the one body of Jesus Christ. And the principle that keeps us united to one another, with one another, is called the Holy Spirit. If we take the Holy Spirit out of the picture, the body is no longer alive. The body dies. It decomposes. It fragments. That's why Jesus in John chapter 17 prays for that unity, that they may be one 
as you, Father, and I are one, so that they may be one in me and you in you. Because the call is for us to be drawn into the circle of Trinitarian union or communion, to have fellowship. That's why St. John, explaining to us why he's proclaiming the gospel, he wrote his gospel, he emphasizes that not everything Jesus did or said is scripted down. But he says that this is written that you may come to believe and then have fellowship with us, meaning the apostles, because their fellowship is with Christ. The proclamation of the gospel, its purpose is to invite children of God that they may be united in one body, which is the mystical body of Jesus Christ. And in that body, the Life of God is infused in them that those who are dead to sin now become alive to God. So that is unity in the church. Okay, so we follow this text. So we are on page 113. Those of you who have books, we can share. Okay, 113. The Holy Spirit is the principle of unity in the church. So, we read and explain, all of us have been given to drink of the one spirit. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, and John 8, verse 38, and the following verses. All of us have been given to drink of the one spirit. How do we drink of the one spirit? The same spirit. Baptism. 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 We are baptized into what? Romans chapter 6, verse 3, we are baptized into the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus is to what? To sin. He died to sin. So we are baptized into dying to sin that we may rise to new life in him. But the principle that brings that about, that causes that to take place, is the spirit of the Father and the Son, whom we call the Holy Spirit. So we drank of that same spirit. So make every effort to preserve the unity which has the spirit as its origin and a peace as its binding force. That's Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with you know, verse 3 and on. This is a very important statement of faith. Make every effort to preserve the unity which has the spirit as its origin and the peace as its binding force. So, Christians are called to labor. To labor for what? For unity. As those of you who are married, when you finish making the vows, how do the vows go? I No, no, no. Okay, Maria, say the vows. <laughs> it has been too long. <laughs> Who still remembers what you said at your wedding? Okay, let's say, I, Maria, take you, Jose, to be my husband. Huh? I promise. Mm -hmm. To be true to you uh -huh. in good times, bad, in sickness and in health, uh -huh. to love you and to honor you. No, nobody remembers. <laughs> That's 50, 52 years ago. 52 years ago, I don't remember. You don't remember. Okay, so which has the spirit as its origin? So you say those words, okay? I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. And then the priest comes and blesses as you join, you join your right hands. And the priest says, da, 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 da. And what God has joined no one must separate. What God has joined, no one must separate. So marriage, marriage is 
the symbol, you know, it's a sacrament, not just a normal symbol. In theology, we call them real intrinsic symbols. It's the reality, the symbol, the reality that symbolizes the union of Jesus Christ and his church. That's why from Genesis, creation, all the way to restoration and in, in revelation, everything is framed in nuptial terms. God marrying humanity, nuptial union, Christ the bridegroom, we the bride. So what God has joined together, no one must separate. So every Christian has the duty to strive for unity because what God has joined, no one must separate. Anyone, everyone who causes division in the church commits a grave offense against the Holy Spirit. It's trying to undo, it's like trying to undo what the work of the Spirit is. It's trying to undo what God is recreating. So the early church took this very seriously. Today, we are just like a kumbaya. Yeah? But in the early church, it was taken very, very seriously. That's why those who sought time and again to divide the church were ostracized in what we call excommunication. Not that they were sent to hell, but come to your senses because we can't deal with division in the church. Because you're trying to undo the work of the Holy Spirit. And so that is our duty, Christian duty, to strive for unity. We are united to Christ. We must remain there. And so how do I strive for that unity? Number one, by trying my best in my personal life to respond to the grace of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Because I can't call others to unity, to which unity I don't belong which unity I do not belong. In fact, talking about that unity, the saint we celebrate today, Cyprian of Carthage, okay, saints Cornelius and Cyprian, Cyprian of Carthage, during his time, there was a controversy. This was the third century, very early on. There was a controversy in the church. There were heretics who had divided the church. And so these heretics were baptizing people in their heretical communities. And that drove St. Cyprian crazy. And so he made a statement that these heretics are outside of the church. But over there, they are baptizing. But they too were baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit because we were using the same formula okay, of baptism. So when those people who were baptized into these heretical communities, we realized that they were in the wrong. When they came back to the flock, St. Cyprian would baptize them. And his reasoning was that if the heretics are outside of the church, they can't baptize people into the church because they are already outside of the church. They can't baptize people into the church. And so Pope Stephen heard about this um, Pope Stephen, was Stephen, I think, yeah, Stephen then, I think Stephen. He heard about this um, practice and then he wrote to St. Cyprian that no, you can't do that. If a person is baptized, they are baptized. And Cyprian insisted no, because they are baptized by heretics who are outside of the church. If you're outside of the church, you can't baptize people into the church. Who was right? Who was right? If you're a heretic, you're outside of the church, can you baptize people into the church? Okay. So this was 200 something, way, way, way back. And so St. Cyprian refused to listen to the Pope because logically he was convinced that if these people are outside of the church, there is no way they can baptize people into the church. And so 
Time went on. St. Cyprian continued with his practice. And then he died for the faith. He was martyred for the faith. And then a few, whatever later, also, the Pope was martyred for the faith. And I think they continued their argument in heaven. <laughs> so it was, it was, a hundred years later, when the great St. Augustine came, that gave the answer to that question, that the Pope was right and Cyprian was wrong. <laughs> okay? <laughs> because St. Paul talks about it, okay? In, um, in, so he says, do you belong to Cephas, Cephas? Do you belong to Paul? When Peter baptizes, it is Christ who baptizes. When Paul baptizes, it is Christ who baptizes. So as long as someone uses the right matter and the proper formula, a person is baptized. Because it is Christ who baptizes. In case St. Augustine used it in Latin terms, ex opere operato, ex opere operatus. Okay? So, it is Christ who is baptizing. How about outside the church? Pardon? How about outside the church? Outside of the church, for example, Protestantism, mm -hmm. we consider them that there, they have ecclesial elements, we're going to see that later in detail, but they are outside of the church, yeah, the universal Catholic church, they separate themselves yeah, from, from the church. So when an Anglican is baptized in the Anglican church and they want to become Catholic, what happens? They study the Catholic faith and they will be baptized. No. no. What, what happens? No. <laughs> so that's why like, if a Christian is baptized uh, in the approved, you know, they, uh, because they are some, like Mormon baptism is not baptism. Okay, because they don't believe in the Trinity. But Anglicans believe in the Trinity, although they are separated from us. But when someone is baptized in the Anglican communion, in the Anglican churches, and they want to become Catholic to come back to the fullness of the fold, they are not rebaptized because baptism is administered only once. And those baptisms are valid. Okay, and therefore, they are brought simply into full communion in the church. They profess the creed. That's it. They receive communion and they are confirmed. Yes. Because the baptism in those churches, there are some churches which are just way out of there. You, know, they, you don't even know what they believe. That, but the mainline Protestant churches, their baptism is valid. Okay. So because it is Christ who? baptizes. So, but I've brought that up to, of course, it's St. Cornelius and Cyprian today, but also to emphasize the point of unity in the church. Number one, one that some people think that if they want to become a saint, they have to have lived a perfect life. <laughs> no. No, it's just a process of growing. So someone, oh, how, why is it that St. Cyprian is a saint when he disobeyed the Pope? <laughs> okay. So things like that happened. They were both, you know, St. Cyprian was a prolific theologian. Pope Stephen was not. But he is the Pope. So he has the charism okay, to lead the church into all truth. Although he didn't have these lofty theological arguments like St. Augustine did later, but he was right. He is the Pope. That's why I always tell you that you, we can respectfully, you know, say things about the Pope. And, uh, you know, like uh, there could be something we call positive criticism, but disparaging the Pope is out of the picture. So some people disparage the Pope because of their political ideologies. Because this Pope is not in line with my political ideologies, he doesn't support my politician, therefore I don't listen to him. Okay, who do you listen to? <laughs> who do you listen to? Okay, so as we said before, again, the principle of unity, Jesus said, Peter, Satan has asked for you to sift you like wheat. 
but I have prayed for you. So Satan didn't stop with Peter. Satan continues with the successors of Peter. Satan has asked for you to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. So for Catholics to be simply preoccupied with criticizing the Pope instead of doing what Jesus does for Peter, which is prayer, prayer. prayer to pray for Peter. Some of us are just, oh, the Pope, the Pope. Okay, what are you doing as a Catholic? Okay, causing division and disunity. So the Pope is the principle of unity. So um, again, you know, looking at uh, Cyprian, 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 to make sure that uh, we emphasize this point very well. <clears throat> Pope Stephen and Cyprian. So, the Pope has a chair called a cathedra. Okay? <laughs> cathedral. <laughs> like this cathedral, there's a chair in the cathedral, that chair, is the cathedra of the bishop of Las Vegas, or the archbishop of Las Vegas. It means chair uh -huh. Yes, so it's the chair. But the chair of Peter is in Rome, and his successors, we call them popes. I think this comes from Italian, whatever, Latin, papa, father. Okay. So the chair of Peter has three principal functions. Number one is... To unite the whole church. Number two is to and number three is to unity, strength, and stability. So that's why this chair is called the rock foundation. The rock. Petra. Petro rock on which the church is built. So if you build a church on a rock, that church is a structure. If you build a house on a rock, that structure, house is one unit. It is strong and stable. That is the chair of Peter. Because oftentimes you see um, the Pope Usually this pope, okay, he says a certain statement, but it requires a lot of background information, but he just throws it out there. And then sometimes it gets to, to agitate things. But if you understand it theologically, the background, then it's a correct statement. When a highly charged, you know, political, whatever, so um, <laughs> we'll see. But that, that, that's unity, okay? So the principle of unity, the Holy Spirit, he... That principle is like the soul in a body, keeping every part of the body a single unit. Each part of the body has a different function, but they, are all co they all coordinate for a single purpose, life. So that is the Holy Spirit. So am I striving for unity as a member of the body of Jesus Christ? And how do I do it? Do I strive for unity? Yes, I do by being envious. By being malicious, right? By being a gossip. By being angry because politicians are calling us to be angry about things. That's how we, dis we create disunity in the church. Some of you work in church circles, different groups and whatever, okay? The vying of power within church structures. That's the one of the principal major causes of disunity in the church. I'm in charge of this. I'm in charge of this. I'm in control of the dust on the pews. I mean, <laughs> so believe me, you have pews and there's dust on it and put someone in charge of it, they will be so protective of their dust that they don't want trespassers. I'm in charge. My dust. It's, that's how we create disunity in the church.
And so we have always to be attentive to the movement of the Holy Spirit, who is the principle of unity, because we can't be united if we are not attentive to the spirit of unity. So that's why this statement in Ephesians 4, as we said before, as we study ecclesiology, we need to study St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, because that entire letter is Ecclesiology 101. That's why we quote it often. So, there is but one body and one spirit, just as there is but one hope. No. Make every effort to preserve the unity which has the spirit as its origin and a peace as its binding force. So we said, how do we strive for unity? By striving for peace. What is peace? The concept of peace in uh, the biblical sense, shalom, okay, is in right relation with God and with neighbor. Right relation with God and neighbor. That's the concept of shalom. So shalom equals the way things should be. That's the meaning of the word shalom. The way things should be. That is, in union with God, in union with fellow humans, and in good relation with creation. That is the concept of shalom. And so, in, the, in order for there to be shalom, we have to look at the principle that destroys shalom. That the principle is called Because in the very beginning, there was a, a condition, okay, in the very beginning when God created, there was a condition we call original, Justice. original, Justice. original, Justice. original. Justice. <laughs> so every time Catholics talk about original, the answer is sin. <laughs> but it's called original holiness or justice. Because original sin came later. Okay? That's why we say sin is not integral to our nature. Sin is a disease that invaded our nature because our nature is very good. So that state of original holiness is what is called shalom. Human integrity with God and neighbor. And so there was no problem anywhere. You know, as Genesis pictures it using symbols, God would come to the garden he created and the humans he created and he would walk with them and converse. There was friendship, communion. Okay. So that is shalom, the way things should be. Now, in our situation, the way things should be, because of the recreation brought about in Christ by Christ Jesus, our shalom should be reconciled with, be reconciled to God and neighbor and creation. So that is how we keep peace. That's why Jesus tells us, I'll give you peace not as the world does. What does that mean? How does the world give peace? We can say that there is peace here because there is no war. But the peace we are talking about here is not absence of war. It is absence of sin. So unless human sin is addressed, there will never be peace among humans. We may think we are not at war, these overt wars like in Ukraine, but there is war raging in my heart. There is war raging in our families. War raging in everywhere. The war is raging in here in the human heart. Because this principle is not uprooted, and therefore there cannot be peace. So I give peace, not as the world does, but as God does, because I am the one who can uproot the principle of chaos from you and give you the gift of peace. So the first step of striving for peace, okay, St. Paul tells us here, uh, and peace as its binding force. In order for us to strive for peace, 
the number one thing, you know, because it's the binding force. If you take our peace, the church fragments, the body fragments. So peace is the binding force. So in order for me to bind, to be bound to the church and to assist others to be bound to the church, I have first two. The first step is addressing sin. It's that simple, to address sin. Now, as stati statistics show, and they're right, over 70% of Catholics don't go to confession. Over 70% of Catholics don't go to confession. But we have to strive for peace, which is the binding force. And the destroyer of peace is sin. But sin is not addressed, but we want peace. God, give me peace. This is the way to peace. I don't want to go there. <laughs> but I want it. Yeah. It's like we make it impossible for God to give us what we want. Because he shows us, shows us the way, but no, I want to do it my own way. But I want what you offer. Okay. So most of us are like a toddlers in terms of the faith. You know, a toddler wants to like do, do something, and you say no, and they go into a tantrum. Because that's the only weapon they have, screaming. They can't fight you, okay? So they scream and give you that as a weapon. Yes. There's no other principle of disunity in the church except sin. But unfortunately, oftentimes, I'm quick to see the other's sin. Okay, Jesus is very clear about that. I have a log, a log in my eye, but I see a prank, you know, a small speck in someone else's eye. Please remove that thing. But you have a plank. How are you able to see? <laughs> that is the principle of unity in the church. And then once we address that, then everything else follows. Because, as you know, disunity is caused by sin. The number one sin mm -hmm, from which all sin grows is called? Pride. Uh, scripture refers to it as the reservoir of all sin. Like if you want to collect all sin, you do one thing become prideful, and then all the other vices will follow. It's in Sirach, chapter 10, verse 6 through 18. It talks about the evil of pride. It's like our weaknesses don't change every other day. And so if a person is going to commit sins, they'll be along the same fault line. So, but what we need to do is, like if I did it 10 times before, then I have a list of three or two, whatever. So we have to keep improving. But we have, as human beings, we have always to be aware of that. Hmm? That's how we are able to be compassionate a little bit with, or patient with fellow sinners, knowing that if they have a particular weakness, their sins will be along that same fault line. That's where they, they have that weakness. Okay? Also, to not this that if we want to improve, yes, the Holy Spirit is there to help us, but human effort is also involved. We have to cooperate with the grace of the Holy Spirit. It's not just I went to Mass, then I'll be holy. No. I went to Mass, I listened, God equipped me, now I'm ready for the battle. I went to confession, God has equipped me, and now I'm ready for the battle. So we have to be equipped like that. One time, there is a, a, a person not here, elsewhere, not in this country, <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> so they used to come to confession to me, and they were confessing, as you said, the same sin, more or less, and I kept giving them the same biblical text to go and read because it was the medicine for their problem. Because my words, I can speak and speak, but my words don't have the power of the word of God. So go, read the word of God. That's the best way to reform our lives is to listen to the word of God and do what the word of God tells us. And so after some time, she came and complained to me, but Father, you, kept, you keep giving me the same text. 
And I said, what did you confess today? That's why I keep giving you that text. Because if you followed it, we wouldn't be here doing, going through the same thing over and over again. But that is human weakness. Okay? That's human weakness. And Jesus knows it. Jesus knows it. That's why Matthew 18. Yes, Matthew 18. Maybe starting with some verse 23. But Matthew chapter 18. Where if my brother, sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? Jesus gave us the answer right there. Okay? It is so unfortunate that because of our human stubbornness that the gospel is right there and we do the contrary, including within the history of the church, things have happened whereby, not, not universally, but in some circles, some bishops, some priests would tell people like in the early church, God willing, if we are still together, we'll study the sacrament of confession, whereby it was said that you confess your sins in life only twice, once or twice. If you commit sins again, then the church can't forgive you. It's between you and your God. That happened in the history of the church. When the church has the scriptures which say, how often should I forgive? 77 times, which means always. But now the church telling people sinners, no. Only twice. If you've seen, the, so that the way, where that happened, people stopped going to confession because they knew that they're going to sin again. And that's why they waited and waited until they were at the point of death. That's one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons why the sacrament of anointing of the sick is called last rites. <laughs> people fear last rites. Because who can survive last rites? <laughs> so when a priest shows up, so, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so in sin, there is what, uh, now you are taking us into confession. <laughs> but because of it, uh, let's just address that very briefly here. Yeah, because we can think of, uh, you know, we, we don't have to be suspicious of other people's intentions, especially when they are going to confession. We don't, we are not suspicious of their intentions. But, you know, a priest in confession can know, okay? And then they can assist uh, this person to, to progress. So, in order for one to have a, a confession, there are four parts of confession. Number one is contrition, contrition. Number two is confession of sins. Number three and four can be interchangeable. Mm -hmm. That is, which is, it can be reparation, it can be penance, it can be, um, Whatever, it's your reparation penance, usually we call it penance. But properly reparation. Number five. This word means to unbind. Sin binds us in chains. So when God forgives, the chains are cut loose. And we are unbound, we are free. Okay? That's the meaning of absolution. I absolve you. So we are going to concentrate on this for now. So a, a contrite heart is someone who is truly sorry for the sins they have committed because of love of God. And they recognize how much God had loved them and how much they have betrayed him, like disappointed God. However, many times we go to confession without contrition. We go with what we call attrition. Like someone may do dumb th something dumb at work and they are afraid that they are going to fire them. And that leads them to confession. 
fear of losing a job. Okay? So they are not yet here. So a priest in confession can assist this person to arrive here. Okay? Yes, but in many times we go to confession with not perfect contrition, but attrition. But a priest has, you know, should know how to lead us to contrition. Okay, so, but uh, we shouldn't be suspicious of people's intentions. Um, there is uh, a Pharisee, can't remember this text off the top of my head, look it up. The uh, a Pharisee called Simon, and Jesus went to the, his house. And there was a woman who was known, she lived on the strip in Las Vegas. <laughs> so the woman was known in town. And so this woman came, Jesus is seated there in the house of Simon the Pharisee, and the woman is crying and kissing the feet of Jesus and wiping Luke chapter 7, verse, beginning with verse 36. Hmm? Verse 36 to 50. Yeah, 36 to 50. So, so the woman is, you know, wiping the feet of Jesus with her hair. And Simon the Pharisee, you know, the pose of a Pharisee. You see how they go like that. They appear intelligent. If they have glasses, you know, they go like that. <laughs> the, pose, the pose of a Pharisee. <laughs> so he was looking at Jesus. He said, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. Okay? Suspicious of people's intentions. He would know what kind of woman this is. The woman was contrite. She was crying because she saw and understood Jesus. He gave her the light of faith, and she understood who he was. And the Simon the Pharisee was trying to think that maybe she's trying to seduce him, but he can't even see that. What kind of a prophet this is? So Jesus, knowing the thinking of Simon, he addressed him. Okay, so when we see people trying to do good, we shouldn't think that they have ulterior motives because that's where the devil tempts us so much into being suspicious. That's what we call the rush to judgment. Okay? Suspicious of other people's intentions. I know him. He's not that good. He's pretending. I know how he treats her. So that idea of don't judge is not a Christian. Okay, so we hear it often. Don't judge, don't judge. But uh, so this is clear. Okay, so unfortunately, many of us sometimes it's uh, attrition. Okay, you know, I don't want to go to hell, <laughs> but it's not really love of God that is leading me to realize that I have offended Him. So a priest in confession will always assist us to get to a contrition. But most of us go with attrition. We need a journey to walk into that. Okay, so um, I think this is a important. Route. What time is it? 11 o'clock. Okay, so we'll take a short break after this, okay? So um, to judge, okay? Oh, the, the Hebrews call judgment, or justice, judgment, mishpah. That's how they call it, mishpah. So it has a three senses. Number one is, you know, what we call number two, we talked about that. Rush to judgment. Number three is what we call a Corrective or salvific judgment. Judgment. Here the, the text we can think of is uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, I think beginning with verse 13, around there. Ezekiel chapter 3, and also Ezekiel chapter 33. So, 
we can't condemn people. So every time the Bible in English talks about stop judging, I will not be judged, and how you measure will be measured out to you, it's mostly these two. Okay, I don't have the keys to hell. So I can't tell you, I saw you do something, you're done, you're going to hell. <laughs> I may say that if we persist in this behavior, we may end up being separated from God forever. That's what the church teaches. We teach, we teach that constantly. And that's a judgment. So we make a judgment. Like if uh, I do something good, what would you say? Good. If I do something good. Yeah? What would you say? A good job. Why are you judging me? <laughs> but it's a judgment. So we can judge. <laughs> okay? Okay? Yes. So, rush to judgment. It's always, this is what we've been talking about, suspicious of people's intentions. Like, you know, we live in Las Vegas. You see a young girl you know walking by the strip at 2 a.m. in the morning. You're on the other side, and you go, I didn't know she's a prostitute. <laughs> she's just walking by. You don't know that. That's called a... <coughs> Rush to judgment. Okay? But a corrective judgment is our obligation. It is our duty. St. Paul calls it admonishing one another. St. Paul's letter of the Colossians, chapter 3, verse 16. Admonish one another. Colossians 3, 16. That is one of the spiritual works of mercy. If we don't do this kind of judgment... We commit a sin against our neighbor. It's a sin against the charity. If you see me commit a sin, it's not just something petty, but something that has really eternal consequences that I may lose salvation forever. And you say, oh, it's between him and his Jesus. You are neglecting your neighbor and you're committing a sin. And God, if I die in my sin, God will hold you accountable for my death. So the, idea, so the idea of don't judge, don't judge, you have to understand its context. Like in Romans chapter 2, when St. Paul emphasizes that Romans chapter 2, don't judge, don't judge, he's referencing the Hebrews because in addition to natural law, the law of reason, they had also been given revelation in the scriptures. So they were in a much better place than pagans to do the will of God. But they were doing the very same things the pagans were doing, sometimes even worse. And so in that context, St. Paul addresses them and says, who are you to judge your neighbor? But there's a context. Okay? The context is you have much more than them, but you are judging them, but you do the very same things and even worse. They only have natural law to go by. You have much more. So that's the context of these things. But then we just to say, oh, don't judge. You hear that a lot in the media. Don't judge. The media people, from morning to morning, they are judging. <laughs> if they're not judging Biden, they're judging Trump, they're judging... Come. So they're judging all the time, and they tell us, don't judge. <laughs> so, okay. Let's take a short break. <laughs> 